Hello students, as I've mentioned and announced previously, today's class is online. I've got a meeting in South Charleston, so we're just going to strictly do this on YouTube. Uh, this lecture is for the 1st of March 2019. This is class 20 of the semester. So let's look at a couple of announcements before we get into external rate of return. Uh, the first announcement is that homework number 8 should be uploaded to MU Online before class time, which is noon, on Monday the 4th of March. And, uh, of course, if you have any questions on that assignment, I'd be glad to help you out. Uh, just uh, send me an email, and I'll do my best to respond quickly. Also, uh, remember that the project is going to uh, be due. Ultimately, the final project is due on April 19th. And so uh, don't delay looking at that. Have you already read through the entire handout? Um, my suggestion, if, if you're going to divide it up into pieces and make it manageable bites along the way, maybe what you should be doing already is gathering some data on the income you expect to make from work. So, you know, investigating your career, what the salary is likely to be, and how that varies from place to place. Um, and then also start looking at your regular expenses, not only when you first graduate, but then thinking about how those expenses could change as your life circumstances change over time. All right, so as I previously mentioned, uh, today's lecture is covering external rate of return, and uh, the rest of this video is taken from a previous semester. I'm emailing you an accompanying PDF file, the in-class exercise that is going along with this lecture. Now, there may be a couple of incidental references to times and dates that don't quite line up, but uh, of course, these announcements govern what's due for you in the coming future, and uh, if you have any questions about what you watch in the video, please let me know. Who likes art? I sometimes go to museums when I'm in big cities, but I'm usually disappointed. Because I end up at like modern art museums where they have like a pile of paper clips on the floor. And you got to pretend like that means something, right? I like the art that, you know, the thing looks like the thing. I guess that's because I'm an engineer, right? But. Uh, Here's a, a piece of art. This is Gauguin. Yeah, I remember that from middle school, which is the last time I took an art class. Uh, the name of this is, uh, this painting is called, When Will You Marry? I guess it's pretty nice. It seems, you know, there's some palm trees. Who doesn't like palm trees? Somebody liked it well enough that uh, they paid $300 million for that painting back in February 2015. So that's a pretty high price. It set a record at the time for the most that had ever been spent for a piece of art. I think it might have been exceeded since then, but uh, it's one of the recent really high amounts. But here's the crazy thing, is that uh, in 1893, when it was originally sold, um, it was sold for $750. And so if you compound that into today's dollars, it was 20000 And so, you know, 20000 bucks is a lot for a painting. Um, but it's nothing like 300 million. So why do I bring this up? Because remember, we were just talking about the internal rate of return. We wouldn't be able to calculate the internal rate of return for this investment. We couldn't. Um, so you may be thinking, well, why not? We could make a cash flow diagram. Like we could have the initial outlay in year zero was 20,000. And then we've got a lot of years. Uh, how many years is that? A uh, hundred and twenty-seven? Uh, no, no. Oh boy, I'm so bad at math. 115 plus seven. When you're standing up in front of the class, your arithmetic abilities decreases a little bit. It's 122. So let's say uh, so you're 122, and then it's a uh, inflow of. 300 million. How come we can't calculate the internal rate of return for this? No, it's not negative. That's a good guess, though. Let, let's see if, if Excel would allow us to do the internal rate of return. Year, amount. OK, so year 0 is. Uh, negative 20,000. And then we've got to go 1, 2, and we've got to go to 115. So this is going to be a long one. 17. 
Oh, 122. All right, so 122. Okay, and so we need to put zeros in all of these because they didn't sell anything yet. So let's go all the way down here. And then it was $300 million. That's a lot of zeros. Let's just make sure that I typed it in right. That's one of the reasons why I prefer to have currency instead of general. With general, the commas aren't there. If you've got currency, then the commas help you to see that you did it right. So 300 million. Okay, so then I'm just going to do the IRR function. Okay, so IRR equals IRR, and then we have to have all of these amounts. Boy, it doesn't seem like that much when you calculate the IRR, but what I'm saying is, here's what I'm saying. This is not the IRR. Hmm. So why not? Exactly. It's not internal. What is the assumption of the internal rate of internal rate of return? Right. So the person sold this painting. They can't take their profits. They can't take the three hundred million dollars and put it back into the same painting because they just sold it to somebody else. And so the reason I bring it up is just this is like the perfect illustration of a situation where you can't calculate the internal rate of return because the profits have to go somewhere else. In this case, it can be reinvested in some other art, but that other piece of art that's being purchased, it's probably not going to appreciate the same amount over the same time period. And so it's just going to be a different situation. And so this is the most extreme example of that. But what it tells you is there has to be some other method for calculating rate of return when you can't reinvest into the same project. Because that's a pretty narrow scope. IRR can only be applied when you're putting the profits into the same project or into another project that earns exactly the same interest rate. And that's rare. It really only applies to financial instruments like bonds, CDs, savings accounts, and so on. Because those are the kinds of things that allow you to um, keep your earnings or keep your dividends in the same thing. Most businesses don't. So how are we going to get around the limitation of IRR? The way is that we're going to go beyond the IRR functionality and calculate what's called the external rate of return. That's often abbreviated ERR, external rate of return. And it's what you calculate when you're not able to reinvest the earnings back into the same project. So you're putting the money someplace else. So just as an illustration, what if you're buying a rare painting and then you're selling it? You have to buy something else with those profits. You can't put it, put it back into the same painting. OK, so here's what external rate of return is. It makes use of something called the external reinvestment interest rate. And that's abbreviated in our book, I sub I. Other books abbreviate it with the uh, Greek character epsilon. And so um, if there are some notes that where I still use epsilon, I'll have to change that. Uh, in fact, some of your printouts may have epsilon. But uh, either way, what it means is that there's an external reinvestment rate. And what that is is that's what the, the rate that you're earning on the profits that you're putting someplace else. So the, the guy who sold the painting, that person probably put that money into like a, a bond, or maybe into a stock that pays a dividend, or maybe into a savings account. But wherever that money went, it's making interest. And so what is that external interest rate? That's what we're calling I sub I. So it's I sub I, again, is the interest rate that your cash flows that are being generated, it's the rate that those cash flows earn after they're generated. So it's where you're putting your profits. So here's the method. Uh, the method is a little complicated, and that's why on the back side of the page I've given you a template. And in fact, I've put a, a spreadsheet on MU Online that has this template file in it, just so you don't have to take the time to type it in so that we can dig right into the numbers and not fiddle around with just typing and formatting and so on. We'll get to that in a minute. But here's the method. 
what you need to do, first of all, is take all of the outflows, so that means the money that you're spending, you take those to the present, and you're discounting them at I sub I, where I sub I is the interest rate that you're actually putting your profits. I sub I is usually given. It's not the unknown you're solving for. It's, it's told directly. It, you know, in a problem statement, I'll say you're doing some business, and all of your profits go into a savings account that makes 5% or whatever. So you'll usually be given this external reinvestment rate. So you use it to discount the outflows to the present. Now the inflows get moved to the future. So the inflows are compounded to the end of the cash flow diagram, to year N. And so you again use that same external reinvestment rate, I sub I, to do that conversion. And then step three, to solve for the external rate of return, you're having to solve for some unknown interest rate that brings the inflows and the outflows into equilibrium. And so the best way to do that is those amounts that you took to the future, the inflows that were compounded to the future using the external reinvestment rate, discount them to the present at some guess interest rate, and then play around with the guess until the inflows and the outflows are equal at the present. All right, so that's a complicated process. Uh, and so to help make it a little bit more clear, I've cr come up with this like visual representation of the steps. So watch this up on the screen. Don't look at your computer right now. Here on the screen, so we've got a cash flow diagram. And step one is move all of the outflows to the present. And you can see there's one big line pointing down at the present. That means that here we had multiple outflows. Take them all to year zero and you use the external reinvestment rate to do that. Step two, take all of the inflows to the future. Again, making the conversion at the external reinvestment rate. So that's step one and step two. So you'll now have some cash flow diagram that looks like this. And now, uh, see this where there was an inflow and an outflow in the same year? take the net amount. So if it's a net positive, take it to the future. If it's a net negative, take it to the uh, year zero. But don't take the bottom part to year zero and the top part to the future. Because if you take both of them their separate ways, it'll give you the wrong answer. You have to find the net difference if both inflows and outflows occur in the same year. So that's an important word of warning. All right, then step three. You've got these amounts that are in the present. Take it to the, uh, I'm sorry, these are in the future. The inflows are in the future. Take it to the present, and we're going to be solving for some unknown interest rate. And so you play around with the interest rate until the amount of the inflows at the present and the amount of the outflows at the present are equal. So we just did something similar to that with the internal rate of return, you know, using goal seek to try and make something equal to a known number. So you'll do a goal seek, and then the external rate of return is what makes those in equilibrium. So one of the things that makes this a little bit confusing, I think, is the fact that external reinvestment rate and external rate of return have some of the same words. They both say external, and they both have the word rate. But don't let that fool you. You know, keep it separate. The external reinvestment rate is given. The external rate of return is unknown, and that's what we're solving for. So the external rate of return is the unknown interest rate that makes there be a balance between the inflows and the outflows when everything's taken to the present. Here's the formula that shows the same thing that I just talked about, but I guess that's probably the most confusing way to try and sort it out is with a formula. But just briefly, what you're doing is you're saying that the expenses and the revenues are equal. But you have to take the expenses to the present. So that's the outflows to the present. You take the revenues to the future. And you do both of those things at the rate I sub I. So I sub I is the given external reinvestment rate. 
And then what you're doing is you're solving for the unknown uh, external rate of return when you take all of these expenses which have been moved to the present. Uh, you take those expenses to equilibrium with the revenues by applying the F slash P factor. All right, so let's get some practice with this. Um, I told you that there is a, uh, <clears throat> a template file on MU Online. So if you go to MU Online and it's like the very bottom of the, of the class page, you'll find it there. Be sure to save your file. All right, ICE 13 template file. Click on it. Hopefully, it'll give you the option to download. Open it up. All right. So you'll have that, and uh, here's the statement. We've got this net cash flow. And the reason why I'm emphasizing net is because, remember, if a revenue and a cost occur in the same year, you find the difference between the two. Okay, So we have here our net cash flows. Uh, we can't do reinvestment. So we have to calculate the external rate of return. And all of these profits that get generated are going to be put, put into an account that yields 2.5%. So that means the external reinvestment rate is 2.5%. So we want to know what's the external rate of return for this project. Now the template file, what I've done is I've outlined for you what the process should be. Um, we've got here a time column, years until year seven. Why did I give you that? What's the purpose of that secondary time axis? Exactly, good. So it's for calculating future values. Because remember, we're going to write down the, uh, the cash flow amount. You already have the, the nets, but put outflows into one column and inflows into another, just to make it more obvious what's going to go into this column versus this one. And once you do the conversions of PV of the outflows and FE of the inflows, sum them up all here, and we'll go to that point. I'll walk you through the last step for calculating the external rate of return. You're welcome to try it on your own, but let's at least fill out this table and then uh, see if we're all in the same spot. There's this separate column for outflow and inflow. So for the outflow column, you don't have to put the negative sign for the, uh, 
for the outflows because since we're calling it outflow, that's kind of already assuming that any amount that we put in this column is going to be below the cash flow diagram, uh, meaning that it's money that's going out from us. Anybody have questions with where things are at so far, finding the sum of the uh, present value of the outflows and the sum of the future value of the inflows? So uh, don't look at your screen right now. Look at this screen. So most of you, I think, are at this point where you found the present value total and the future value total. The present value being the outflows, the future value being the inflows. Remember, the interest rate that you used for all this was the external reinvestment rate. That's the one where all the profits that are being generated are put somewhere else, and you know what that rate is. Um, so we're not going to play around with this. That's fixed. It's given. But we have to start with the guess of the external, reinvest, uh, the external rate of return. So maybe it's 1%. I'll just put in 1% to the begin. Um, now, what this says is find the present value of the sum of the compounded inflows. So here's that. Here's the sum of the compounded inflows. So let me just label it to make it unmistakable. Sum of the compounded inflows. So what this is saying is, Find the present value of this and use this guess value of the interest rate to do it. Some of you aren't watching. You'll be the ones that I'll have to show later. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this amount to the present using our guess value of the interest rate. And so this will tell us what that is. And what we're going to then do is we're going to keep playing with this until that amount equals this amount so that the discounted future values are equal to the, dis the discounted future values of the inflows is equal to the discounted values of the outflows. All right, so I took some guess, 1%. It's not 1%. We'll find out eventually what it is. But now I'm going to do equals PV of this single amount using this interest rate and the number of years. I mean, I have to look. It's seven years to get it from where it is right now, this 37,000 is in year seven. So I'm just going to type in seven years. And it's not a payment. It's a single amount that I want to move from the future to the present. So I'm going to skip over the payment field. And I'm going to make it the negative sign, because otherwise it would automatically flip the value and just click right there. So what is the present value of 37,000? Well, it's 34,000 is the present value if you've got 1%. Okay. So we want to keep playing around 0.02. We're getting closer. 0.03, even better. 0.04, this is getting boring. So now, this is when I say home uh, data, what if analysis, goal seek. And my goal is I will set this equal to 25,928.60 by changing the external rate of return. And it plays around for a little while, and then 
5.22. So this is the final answer. So this is the external rate of return. It accounts for both the rate that the cash revenue is generated and also the amount of the external reinvestment rate. You can think of the external rate of return as kind of being a weighted average. It's taking into account not only how much cash is being generated by the project, but it also takes into account that money, once it's generated, where is it going? So it's taking into account how quickly the cash is being generated by the project itself and also the effect of compounding inside of that external account. So if you've got an ice cream truck and you're getting profits because kids love ice cream, but then you can't make your ice cream cream truck any better. You know, you've already bought the truck, so you're taking your profits and you're putting into a bank account. Your overall weighted rate of return takes into account not only the savings account, but it also takes into account the ice cream truck and the business effect of that. So the external rate of return in this case, what we were doing was we were you know, making some outlay, then we got revenue, then we had to pay a little more, then we got more revenue. So the external rate of return, taking into account how quickly the cash was being generated and the effect of its reinvestment, was 5.22%. OK, I'm going to give you some homework points for your participation in today's in-class exercise. And so please put your name on the paper and set it on this chair on your way out. I'll give the paper back to you on Tuesday. Uh, and of course, save your file. Do you have a question? Um, why don't you just write the external rate of return so that you've got it there and can come back and uh, double check your work later. So it was 5.22 percent. And if you didn't get this, uh, if, if you couldn't get that far, of course, you can continue working on it because you've got the file there. Save your work before you head out. But I'll give you the paper back on Thursday. And this is something you, you've got to practice. So let me emphasize this. There isn't enough practice in the homework to know it well before the exam. You have to do, like, do it over again. You let it soak in a couple of times because the method is, uh, is not that easy and you're not going to have the template on the exam. You'll have to start from a, a blank spreadsheet. So you have to know this well enough that you know the process is take the inflows to the future, take the outflows to the present, relate the two. You're going to have to kind of understand and know it well enough to do it independently without a given template. 